right. You're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Kevin Demoff. How you doing? We're one and two, so I'm, I'm okay, right? Like <laughs> yeah. we're one and zero. Oh, now we're one and two. So if we beat Indianapolis uh, on Sunday, then I'll be good. I'll be right now, I'm just okay. Awesome. Um, well, to kick it off, I assume like the day you're born, you're probably screaming at the screen immediately in the delivery room and watching football and just a diehard fan from the start, right? That, that's actually probably pretty true. Yeah. My parents tell you I learned how to read by reading box scores in the newspaper. Really? Okay. That's so really before good. I read books, yep. I would read the box score. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> so, so that was how I taught myself how to read. And they came down one day and I'm reading the newspaper at breakfast. Now, mind you, I, I don't read books. I'm two or three or whatever it is. But I'm sitting there reading the sports section. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are like, okay, this is not the usual way someone learns how to read. But I'm curious, where'd that come right? from? So, like, how'd you fall into caring at two and three years old about the box scores? Yeah, I have no idea, right? Like, you just kind of wired, you know, my father, you know, used to represent athletes, okay. now kind of represents broadcasters. And so, like, family was in sports, but just always a passion for it. Go to games, you kind of grow up. My family uh, had UCLA basketball season tickets, so that was the one thing we kind of did as a family. We'd go to those games at Poly Pavilion. I'd sleep under the seats. So <laughs> sports was always ingrained everywhere in our world from a, a pretty early age, and you just kind of fall in love with it. And did you – was there was it like I guess as far back as you can remember, you said – did you want to be an athlete at some point or was it always I want to work in an organization? Like what was it as a kid? So I, uh, my parents will tell a great story from the 1984 Olympics when you're, I was seven, so you don't know anything. Yeah. And we had a party at our house. So my dad was working for an agency group at the time. And so we had a bunch of athletes over, um, including a bunch of swimmers, I think Rowdy Gaines and some others who were competing at Olympics. And then uh, the West German national basketball team. So like Detlef Schrempf and Christian Welp and a bunch of guys. Yeah. And I remember one of them brought a gold medal. I think the West German team might've won a bronze. And so I said, does anybody ever want a, you know, Olympic medal in two sports? And they said, no. And I'm like, well, I'm definitely going to be the first. Right. You know, so, you know, that, but when you're seven, you think you actually can be a good athlete. Then you realize, you know, genetics probably aren't going to put you into uh, any sport. So what were you the know, sports? Quickly, Do you have an idea of what those two sports were at seven? Yeah. So I, I, I started swimming actually as a result out of watching the Olympics and kind of falling in love with swimming. So I was a swimmer. I played basketball. Those are really the two uh, that I loved the most as a kid. Yeah. Um, you know, basketball, you realize pretty quickly if you're five, 11, you know, that that's not going to be your sport. That'd be pretty good. And in swimming just takes a lot more dedication than I actually have to get up at 5 a.m. and go do the workouts and really do it. And I, I actually came to quickly understand that I like team sports a lot better than individual sports. That was one of my struggles with swimming, which was like, you know, just love being part of a team and competing and winning as a team. And swimming was way too individual for me. So, you know, pretty quickly realized that if I wanted to be in sports, it had to be something aside from athlete. I always thought I'd become a broadcaster. Okay. Like that was my dream was like, Go become a sports broadcaster or do something like that. And when did that kick in? Did it materialize? When did they, like? Because funnily enough, I had a similar shift on the music side. I thought I was going to be a rock star and a guitarist all from four years old till about twelve when I realized it just wasn't that good. And so then it became I want to be a music manager and be in the music business. So was it like a shift like around that age where you're like, oh, maybe I'm not keeping up? Or when did that happen? You know, it was. I mean, actually, no. Like I, I kind of did it all. You know, I would pretend. You know, I'd go to games and have a pen in front of me and pretend I was calling the game yeah. or, you know, do whatever, you know, kind of covered sports throughout high school. I was the editor of the newspaper, sports editor. I went to college and was the sports editor of the newspaper and I covered basketball, hockey, soccer, women's lacrosse, baseball. I broadcast all those games. So like yeah. I did that all. I think it was in college when you realize like, OK, maybe there are people who are a lot better at this than I am. Like nobody, nobody's hearing my tapes you know, on WDCR in Lebanon, New Hampshire and saying, oh, you should be, you know, yeah. you know, the next Stuart Scott, right? Like that was probably when you realize, okay, maybe no one's come calling. I'm not sure that I'm, you know, and that path is so hard. And I've had friends who have done yeah. it. You know, you go become the broadcaster in Davenport, Iowa, you know, the backup weekend anchor, like it just, that path seemed pretty hard. Although I, one of my first internships ever, um, sports and non-sports, I was a uh, kind of a gopher for what back at the time was the Mighty 690 Radio, which used to be in LA and San Diego. And they opened up a, a studio in basically in Woodland Hills. Mm -hmm. And so I'd go in there and I kind of, I did the night show from nine to midnight. Um, 
at first. And then I was with a guy named Rick Schwartz. And then we went, okay, we got moved to the morning show from like five to nine. Um, and I don't know which was worse, <laughs> you know, as, as a high schooler, like yeah. nine to midnight kind of sucked because you lost your nights like in the summer yeah. and you're like, I'm not cool. Five to nine, you know, getting up at 4 a.m. Yeah. in the summer, you know, it was brutal, although at nine o'clock you were done with the day. So you're like, okay, yeah. like this is, this is a pretty good life. So, you know, I always thought there was a chance radio or TV, but it just never materialized and probably a, a face for radio and a voice for, you know, podcasts. <laughs> Touche. So you went and what did you study in school when you went to college? Yeah. So I was a history major. Okay. Um, and essentially an art history minor, but my focus, my focal, uh, study, my senior thesis was on women's reading and writing habits in Quaker colonial Philadelphia, huh. which is really applicable to yeah. the business of sports yeah. and, you know, and what we do now. So if you want to talk about, you know, friends, libraries, and, you know, the books that got borrowed in, 19, in 1783, I'm your man. There you go. Um, and it's carried through the whole career, know, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I always tell people now when they ask, like, what should I major in if I want to work in sport? I'm like, major whatever you want. Like, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and I was kind of an art history minor. I loved architecture, which probably wound up serving me well when we did SoFi Stadium. But, you know, that was really what I did. I, I was not a did not study any sports or, or business at all in, in college. And so did you go right into the sports industry right out of college or what was the first step after that? Yeah, kind of. So I, uh, in college, kind of continuing the theme, I intern, I worked at NBC Sports and I thought I'd go into sports TV mm -hmm. and I applied for jobs at CBS and NBC and HBO Sports and all of these. Um, and they all basically wound up being minimum wage in New York. And I think I looked and I said, how, how do you live in, you know, New York City on, you know, minimum wage and work the hours you want. So I actually wound up getting a job offer back here in Los Angeles uh, with a guy who was starting a company called Broadband Sports, which was a, which is probably, it was probably 10 to 15 years out of its time. If you take what is now Bleacher Report, SB Nation, we actually owned Roto World at the time. We did athlete websites, kind of like the Players Tribune. Yep. Uh, it was a real mishmash of that. And uh, it was a startup. So when, you know, I did what everybody else did in 1999. I went to work for the internet. Yeah. When I went to Broadband Sports, I think I was like the 30th employee there. Mm -hmm. uh, when I left nine months later, there were 300 employees. Wow. Nine months after that, they were out of business. Yeah, it's a lot of you know, we went through the whole cycle. We were going to have an IPO. We all had stock. We moved to fancy offices in Santa Monica. <laughs> you know, we did it all. Like, it, it, looking back, it, it was a great experience because... You know, you can say you were part of a rocket ship that kind of went up and down. And, you know, when I left nine months in, you could kind of see, you know, the cracks. Yeah. But, you know, it was funny having not studied business at all. Like there were all these things I thought that were wrong. But, you know, what do I know? I'm a 22 year old history major. Yeah. You know, who am I to tell all these, you know, business school MBA grads? And I mean, they were pulling an amazing talent from Disney and, you know, Paramount and all these places like that. They didn't know what they were doing. Turned out, you know. They didn't know what they were doing probably. We were probably ahead of our time. And I had no idea what I was doing, but you know, we were all there. And it was it's amazing that there was actually a great group of talent there, you know, that they had assembled yeah. and uh great a great lesson that a great idea you actually need to time the world right. You need the right leadership, you need the right people. Yep. You know, it's not just having the best idea. Everything kind of needs to work. Yeah. And so did you leave because you saw the writing on the wall or what why like it, that's a short stint as well a, a little bit of both kind of saw the writing on the wall i remember we went into uh i've been working on this project been you know this will date me but back then you know we were looking at the start of the internet you know espn had team pages so if you went to like the los angeles ram and you click the same way there is now yeah. and you know so we did this so aol had approached uh from what I remember, AOL had approached the company and been like, hey, we want you to kind of populate our team pages with all of your information. So then we went to this big company announcement and they said, you know, hey, we're going to do, and I had worked on this project for a while. I was really excited. You know, AOL is going to partner with us. We're going to provide all the information. I remember walking out and saying, oh, what's AOL going to pay us? And I think the person told me like, oh, no, we're paying them like $15 million a year to give them the information. I'm like, look, I don't know a ton about business, but we're doing the work and we're paying them. And like, oh, you don't get it. We're going to sell advertising and merchandise and <laughs> this and that. I'm like, you know, you're right. I don't get it. Yeah. And at the time, so I was actually the other project I was working on, we were building at the time teams didn't have websites. So 
the Cowboys had actually been an investor and we were building them their first ever website. So I spent about four months building, helping build the Dallas Cowboys website. And out of that, we got a ton of offers. The Dolphins, Packers, a bunch of people wanted us to build them websites. Now, mind you, by the way, we were building them websites and paying them for the right to do it. Again, probably not the best business model. And, you know, I was starting to be a little bit doubtful about the path forward for the company. Yep. And I actually got a call from Casey Wasserman, uh-huh. uh, July 4th weekend. And I just assumed he was calling because someone had said, hey, will you go? He had just started an arena football team here in L.A., the L.A. Avengers. They played at Staples Center. And I figured he was calling about doing that. And he's like, hey, heard your name through the grapevine. You know, we're starting a team and everybody says you could be really helpful on the football side. You kind of know it inside out. Would you have breakfast with me? How, how old are you at that point? I was 23. So how did you have a reputation of knowing a lot about football and being helpful with a new team? A lot of it came from, you know, again, I was the son of an agent. So people kind of knew that. But mainly like we had been building these websites. So I would fly around to Dallas, to Miami. And actually there was a person at the Raiders who had recommended me. We had pitched the Raiders. And I think Casey had called the Raiders asking them for, you know, potential names. And within their own building who were young. And I think he gave them my name. And so we... We went to breakfast and he was, you know, at the time, probably mid twenties. I mean, so okay. yeah. yeah he, I mean, and you know, he was like, Hey, you want to come help run an arena football team? And I said, that seems great, crazy, but, but great. Um, and so I, I took a leap of faith and, and went and did that. Had no clue what I was doing. Got to make a ton of mistakes, yeah. but you know, it was, it was great to, to learn. And I would say, you know, the job's not that different than the one I have today. It's just a lot more, a lot more eyeballs yeah, and a lot more zeros, but it was awesome. I got to, you know, help hire a head coach, make trades, sign players. I also picked up Chipotle every day. I took the dry cleaning to the laundromat. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I had to go check everybody in at the airport ahead of the, you know, commercial flight. Like you laid t-shirts at Staples Center for fans. Like you got to do everything. Yeah. And I always say, you know, my, my one thing coming out of that, my advice to people always in sports, like go work in the minor league. Yeah. Because you will get to do so much. Yeah, it's it's so much a startup version where you really get to learn how everything's made. And, and there are not a lot of jobs now at the Rams that I haven't done at some point in my life, mainly because of my four years uh, in the Arena Football League. And Casey was an amazing mentor, an amazing boss. And it, that was really where I got my start, start in team sports and, and forever grateful. We won. A bunch of games, not enough, but it was it was pretty fun. That's awesome. And and what was your official position there? Like, was there a title or were you? I was director of football operations, it. so okay. it was kind of the essentially the the GM. Yeah, and so you said you were there four years, so you hit about twenty seven. Got decent experience by twenty seven in the space. Like, there's probably very few people that even have your level. What what happened next? Uh so you know, kind of did four years in the arena league, and it was funny. The arena league very similar to broadband sports. When I got there. All of a sudden, NFL teams were starting to buy in. Uh, so actually, the Cowboys had bought a team. The Falcons had bought a team. Uh, bon Jovi had bought a team that was part of Philadelphia that was kind of partners with the Eagles. There were a couple of – I mean, John Elway had bought a team in Denver that actually Stan Kroenke was a minority partner in. So all these NFL teams were buying in. And every the Arena League went from being on nothing to NBC was showing games on Sunday – and franchise values had gone from, a, I think Casey probably bought in, you know, million to million. They were selling for 16, 17 million. And it, again, it was this rocket ship. And I remember we, in 2003, we lost in the playoffs to the Denver team, the Colorado Crush, who eventually went on to win the Arena Bowl that year. And I think, if I remember the, correctly, like they played in the Pepsi Center. They had the, John Elway was the owner. They won the title. You know, they they had the Broncos season ticket list. They had all these things going for them. And I think they still didn't make money. I remember asking them, like, I'm like, if they didn't, if John Elway owning a team in Denver and winning the title can't make money, how do any of us make money? Yeah. And, you know, it was a little bit uh, this eye opener. I was at this crossroads for the second time. And, you know, so like, so I was starting to think about leaving. And, you know, now I'm like, maybe I should go to business school because this is the second time I've kind of been in a, in a place where, Everybody in the world thinks this thing is a you know gold mine, and I'm on the inside, and I'm like, I don't get it. Yeah. I'm like, but what do I know? I'm a history major, yeah. and I remember actually we played a game. I think we were four and zero. I think the Georgia Force, which was the team the Falcons own, were four and zero. It was a really good game. Two best teams in the league at the time. And if you remember arena football, fifty yard field indoors, huge nets behind the end zone, and so when you kicked off, 
anytime the ball went off the net, it was a live ball. Mm-hmm. So the game was tied like 28 all with like minute and a half left. We score a touchdown to go ahead 35, 28 with a minute left. We then proceed to kick four straight balls off the net, recover them all for touchdowns. I think we won the game 70 to 28. It was a Broncos dolphins kind of score. Yeah. And, and I remember everybody's walking in the locker room. We're high-fiving and I'm on the, after I'm on the bus, I'm like, that, this is not real sports. Like, yeah. you know, this was a great game and through some gimmick, we just won by 40 points when it was close. I'm like, I gotta go. Like, I think I've maxed out. Yeah. And so I applied to business school, kind of figuring, you know, that would be the next path to kind of go, you know, improve, want to go into business school for two years. And then right before I went to business school, I got a call from uh, my friend who had rec- actually the person who had recommended me at the Raiders. Uh, he had just taken a job as the GM of the Buccaneers. And he's like, would you come to Tampa with me? And I was like, you know, I really think I should go to business school. I need to learn. Like I need to differentiate myself. And he's like, great. You can work for free for me for two years interning during business school. And then <laughs> you can kind of come here. And so that that's basically what I did. Went back to business school for, for two years, interned for the Buccaneers for two years and joined them full time after business school. Awesome. Got it. And so I'm curious because that was such a key connection for you. The guy at the Raiders, was that just, did you build the website for the Raiders or did you just meet him through? You know, I don't think we actually wound up, uh, there was a guy, I remember it was Bruce Allen, who was the GM of the Raiders who went to become GM of the Buccaneers who then went to Washington. Uh-huh. I don't think we wound up building the website, okay. partly because the company eventually folded, but you know, and were you, apparently that pitch, was, that pitch was pretty good. I guess. Yeah. I was going to say, was it like, did you actually have a real relationship with him or is it literally you pitched him? And when he was asked by Casey Wasserman, who should I talk to? He's like, I remember this kid that was great. Like, I mean, look, I never asked, like, I mean, he didn't know my father. Like I never really known Bruce, but like when we pitched, I think it was just like, Hey, here's someone yeah. who, who you should chat with. And then, you know, once, once I was in the arena league, someone who kind of became a mentor and, you know, walked me through and kind of had followed my career at each point. So, you know, I, I don't know whether it was the pitch or you there's know, something to be said. The last name or all of it or, or something in between. One, I, I mean, I have it with my, I'm sure you do too. Like when a YPOer recommends their kid or their a YPOer's kid to come work with you, like there's something about knowing the parent or at least knowing the parent's background and that the kid grew up around a hustle mentality or work ethic. It, it kind of checks a few boxes that makes you more comfortable probably too. So if they, I think that relationship probably did help, but that makes sense. That's all. Look, and, and I think for me, it was like, hey, the Arena League was a great place to be a proving ground. Yeah. Um, and it was great to have someone kind of recommend you, but not to work for them. So they could then judge from afar, whether you were worth a damn or yeah. not, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it's okay. Like I'll recommend you. Hopefully it works out, yeah. you know, and you always hope when you recommend someone and someone hires right. them that it does, you know, but I was just like any, I think anybody who has success in life, you had people who push for you, 100%. you know, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. Yeah. And, and we're all we're all here because someone believes in us at some point, yep. you know, to give us that first opportunity, that that first crack. And for me, you know, Bruce did it, but Casey was the one who actually had to take the leap of faith, you know, and hire me. Yep. And, you know, so but it's been fun coming back here and actually reconnecting and working with him here. Yeah. And so how long were you? You got out of school. How long were you in the Bucks after school? Uh, I was in the Bucks from 2006 to 2009. Okay. Um, so Including the- I did three full seasons in Tampa, but really five seasons kind of with the Buccaneers total. Okay, got it. And what caused you to leave there like after that experience? Yeah, so, you know, kind of by the end of year three, you know, I went to business school and I always had this thought like, hey, maybe within my goal was within – five to seven years of leaving business school to become a GM. Uh You know, then you'd be GM for five to seven years and hopefully become a team president. And that was kind of what I always thought. You know, if you were lucky, there were a few people who had blazed that path and that was kind of the timeline. And so, you know, I got to, you know, we're in Tampa. We started winning a bunch of games. I was there with John Gruden and Bruce Allen. You know, team is pretty good. And, you know, we started getting the end of year three and, you know, you start to think, okay, I'm now... 30, 31, still very young, but like, you know, maybe your name's in the mix, you know, kind of in the media for like a rising GM job or this or that. Uh, And, you know, so you start to think about it. I actually got a call from the Rams, um, you know, so it's late 2008, probably December 2008. And Georgia Frontier, who had owned the team, had just passed away. So Chip Rosenblum, Lucia Rodriguez, two kids, took over the team. And John Shaw, who was a longtime president of the Rams, was retiring. The head coach had, was going to leave. The GM was going to leave. So they're kind of going through a complete rebuild. And they were planning on promoting uh, 
somebody who was like their head of personnel internally to the GM, but they needed someone who understood the salary cap, who understood player negotiations, kind of understood the finance part. And so they're a little bit like, well, would you come as like a co-GM was kind of the, the pitch. And I said, you know, I really have no interest. I have a great job here in Tampa. Like, but if you let me, I know your president just left. If you let me interview to replace the president, like, sure, I'll interview. What do I have to lose? Yeah. And I, I can, I just put it out there, like fully expected them to say, no, <laughs> no way. Yeah. Um, they said, sure, come fly out to LA and interview. So I sat with Chip and Lucia and I kind of pitched them on what I thought a vision would be. And, and look, the, the job was terrible. The team had gone two and 14 in 2008. They'd gone three and 13 in 2007. It was likely to be sold, you know, at some point in the near future. That was kind of, there was an estate tax issue yeah. and, and they were very upfront that they weren't sure they were going to keep the team long-term. You know, the building had a lease issue. It's a small, mar smaller market. Like everything said, this is a terrible job. Yeah. But I've always been a believer. Like I kind of looked in and said, well, if you can turn that team around, then you can really punch your ticket in yeah. and do anything. And so like you shoot your shot and you know, you see what happens. I'm sure no one good wanted the job. They wanted someone really cheap and fungible, I think, because if the team got sold, person probably get fired. Yeah. New owner would have to inherit the contract, like all these reasons. And I'm sure they probably talked to 30, 50 people before me and they're like, no way, no way. And here I am 31 being like, yeah, I'll, let's go. I'm, I'm gung ho. Yeah. You know, but I figure it's got to be a pretty decent offer to leave Tampa. We're potentially playoff bound, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we were nine and three in Tampa that year. We lost our final four games. We were the, became the first nine and three team in the history of the NFL to miss the playoffs. Um, and, at, you know, and I'm still, you know, I have a good life. I'm happy. My wife is nine months pregnant with our second kid. Like you're living in Tampa, which is not so bad too. living in Tampa. Yeah. And, you know, we're happy and. I actually get called and get offered the job Friday afternoon. Rams call and say, hey, you're good. And I'm like, all right, well, let me think about it. And that was the same day John Gruden and Bruce Allen got fired in Tampa. Oh, wow. So all of a sudden then, one of my closest friends in the front office becomes the GM. Yeah. Uh, Raheem Morris, who's now our defensive coordinator of the Rams, becomes head coach, yeah. who was our, you know, DB coach there. And all of a sudden, there's this huge transition. And now you're probably needed as much as ever in Tampa, like they had offered for me to stay. You had this opportunity in St. Louis, and it was a really hard decision. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, I said, you know, let me go take the new opportunity, see what's what. And that's how I wound up with the Rams. And I fully, no idea of what I was getting into. Yeah. Um, and that was 2009. You know, but I, and, I, and I believe, uh, you know, I told her, it was like, what do you think? I'm like, look, they went three and 13, two and 14. You know, there's nowhere to go it up. Yeah. And then we promptly went one. In, we promptly went one in fifteen. So, you know, I, I always tell people now when you take a job and you say there's nowhere to go but up. Like in the NFL, you better be zero and seventeen. Yeah. If you say that, because there's always worse you could do. And I don't think I had any real idea of you know how troubled the franchise actually was uh, at the time. But it's been an amazing journey, and here we sit. This is the start of my fifteenth season yeah. later, which is just it's hard to actually believe and. It was pretty interesting. We opened the season this year in Seattle and my first game ever with the Rams in 2009, we opened in Seattle. So it kind of was like this moment of this first time we had opened in Seattle in 15 years since and kind of was riding on the bus to, to the stadium and thinking like, well, you know, we've done some good things. We've done some bad things in 15 years, but it, it, what an amazing journey yeah. it's been. And you got, you got to bring it back to LA and win a Super Bowl in the first year in their new stadium. That's that you helped put together. So actually going through that, at what point did the Cronkies come in and buy the team? How long were you with the owners that you joined? Yeah, so so Stan Cronkie, when I joined the Rams, Chip and Lucia and their family owned 60% and Stan owned the other 40%. Yeah. So they put the team up for sale in 2009, as they said they would. Yeah. A lot of potential buyers came in, but uh, Stan had a, a matching right to any offer. Mm -hmm. And so eventually Shad Khan, who now owns the Jacksonville Jaguars, put in an offer in February of 2010 to buy the Rams. Stan had 60 days to match. And I had met him a couple of times during the previous year. And so he wound up matching, you know, keeping the team. He got approved, I think, in August of 2010. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I always joke like, you know, because he got the team in August, you kind of knew like, OK, he's not going to make a ton of changes in 2010. Right. But, you know, I, I don't know if you remember in The Princess Bride, you know, the character's always like, the Dread Pirate, Pirate Roberts like, well, today was a good day. I might kill you tomorrow. Yeah. And I always felt like 
when you worked like when Stan took over, it's like, well, today was a good day. I might get fired. Yeah. Like I might get fired. Them all. And f- after 15 years of saying that you kind of wonder like, okay, you still feel that way to, yeah. to some degree, not because of him at all, but you just, you, you go through with that mentality. And you know, then 2010, you know, we actually had a pretty good year. We got, we were seven and eight. We lost in the final game and missed the playoffs. Sam Bradford's rookie of the year. You know, then the next year is kind of the lockout. So you're not making a lot of changes. in it. like just one thing kind of led to another. We wound up building a relationship and, you know, just fortunate to, you know, hopefully gain his trust and, and keep going. And so when did you start? I mean, being in St. Louis, being from L.A., when did the discussion about going to L.A. start to come up? Yeah. So we when I took the job, I, you know, St. Louis had a lease issue. Um, so basically, there was a clause in the lease and when the team moved from Los Angeles to St. Louis that said every 10 years, the stadium in St. Louis had to be one of the top eight stadiums in the NFL. And so in 1995 to 2005, and they kind of waived this provision in 2005. And in 2005, they put together a process through arbitration by which you would determine it the next time. Um, so that arbitration was in 2012. And basically what the arbitration was, was the Rams would present what they thought would make the stadium top eight. The city would present what they thought would make the stadium top eight. And then a pan- if we didn't agree, a panel of arbitrators would decide. Uh, we put together a plan at the time that was $700 million. The city put together a plan that was $120 million, roughly. <laughs> arbitrators ruled in favor of the Rams plan. And so then the city had a choice, which was either they could enact the changes for $720 million, or basically they could our lease reverted to a year to year lease, which meant yep. it ceased to you know, function. So the city basically told us uh, they weren't going to make the changes in July of 2013, which essentially meant we had a year left on our lease and we were then free agents. And not only were they not going to make the changes, but really they didn't have interest in doing very much more. Yeah. And you know, I would say if there, there's one thing you tell, you shouldn't tell a real estate developer, it's basically they, your lease is expiring. You don't have any options. Yeah. Like, like that, that, you know, someone who's, who's entrepreneurial and, you know, ultimately that coincided with Hollywood park kind of becoming available as a property. So, you know, for, for Stan, who's one of the world's preeminent real estate developers and one of the preeminent sports owners, it was really a chance, you know, to put those two together, yeah. return the team to, to Los Angeles. And look, if you, you Google my name in St. Louis, that it's not a good, yeah. a good search. That's how it goes. And look, it was a bruising couple of years to kind of go through the process you know, St. Louis tried to jump in, you know, much after the game and, and build a stadium. Uh, and, and, you know, and then the Chargers and Raiders tried to build a competing project in Carson. Yeah. You know, it was a really difficult two and a half years. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, in January 2016, we won the right to come back. You know, people would always say, like, you know, did you go to the Rams? I'm like, I had no clue when I went to the Rams that any of this would ever happen. Yeah. You know, team, you know, yeah, you figure the team gets sold, but get a new owner, build a new stadium in St. Louis, you stay there. Like you're just trying to do the best job you can. I am curious on that note. Did you think you might be just in St. Louis? Cause like, what's the step after president of our organization? Like you're already the president of the Rams. What did you have a vision of like, what could have been next if it didn't progress? Or? You know, I always thought like, you know, Hey, maybe if I do a good job here, I can go back to Tampa. Right. Yeah. Like, or, yeah. you know, maybe you go to a bigger market or something yeah. happens, but look, like your job is to go make the team as good as possible, right? right? And you, you know, I never thought about what was next. I always thought about we can't fail because you know you just yeah this is your career, and if you fail, you probably don't get another shot. Yeah, right. And so, and so yeah, because it sounds like the rest so like of your, it was always well because the rest of your career sounded always like more stepping, downside risk. Yeah, and the rest of your career sounded like stepping stones. That that president role, like you had arrived in your head, and so then it was just like now deliver. It, you know, it was really interesting when I was in Tampa and I was around so many talented scouts mm-hmm. who were really good at their job and talented personnel people. And I realized, you know what? I won't be as good of a GM as these people, right? Like they truly know the game better. They've scouted it better. You know, my skill set is not a great match for being a GM. Mm-hmm. You know, I do understand the business of football, but I also kind of understand the bigger picture and how it comes together. And so I realized pretty quickly that I'd rather be a, you know, president than a GM if I had the choice. Now, I always figured the path would be you had to become a GM and become a president. When I got the chance at the Rams, one of the unique things was, okay, you could go skip the step, you know, and become president. So, you know, now you had, you know, a dream job. You're president of an NFL team, yeah. you know, whether it's the best team or the worst team, yeah. you're still in the NFL running a team and, and loved every second of it and, you know, really enjoyed the challenge of trying to turn it around in St. Louis. I mean, we actually made a bunch of you know, we never kind of broke through and had that winning season. And, and look, anytime, 
anytime you move a team, it's a referendum on, you know, what happened. Like we didn't do a good enough job to have success, which, you know, which is one of the reasons the team moved. I mean, LA is a little bit of a different opportunity, right. but for the most time when a team moves, it's because you failed previously somewhere else. Yeah. Got um, for, for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. And, you know, so you always figure like, hey, I just want to go be successful here and make this team successful. And, you know, maybe you get a job, you know, at a big market, you're at the Bears or the Giants or the Niners at that time. But the idea like, oh, you're going to bring the NFL back to Los Angeles, like, you know, so many people had failed, you know, Michael Eisner and you know, Michael Lovitz and, you know, Marvin Davis and Casey had taken a stab, potentially get a same, like so many great people in Los Angeles had tried to bring a team back. And failed. Like you're not sitting there thinking like, oh, this is going to happen. And, you know, kind of when it did, you kind of look at it from a ramp like, OK, this is a chance to go build the world's greatest stadium and one of the world's greatest markets and, you know, truly bring the NFL back to Los Angeles. Like it's a great challenge. Yeah. But it wasn't one that you're like you set out in your career and like, oh, I want to be part of the group that brings NFL back to Los Angeles. Right. Like very serendipitous. You wound up right place, right time. Yeah, and that's awesome. And so how was the process of like building out that stadium? And like the you said there were a couple years that it was tough and then it started to really ramp up. Like the actual process of moving out here, how was that experience? Because you don't didn't have a real estate development background. I know Stan obviously <laughs> does, but you got thrown into it as well, right? Yeah, I mean, you. we were fortunate. This team doesn't move back to Los Angeles. We had great partners along the way, whether it was our architects at HKS or Wilson Meany, mm -hmm. who had owned and kind of really were running the land in Hollywood Park because it was going to be a mixed-use development. You know, we bought it. Stockbridge was the private equity group that owned Hollywood Park. You know, we jumped right in. We had a great partnership with the Inglewood City Council, Mayor Butts. You know, everything went right. I mean, we just got, you know, break after break. You know, there was a... A Supreme Court ruling in California that allowed us to do a citizens initiative instead of, you know, going through a long sequel process, yeah. you know, and that that meant that someone like AEG, who was trying to build Farmers Field at the time, couldn't really stop you through the environmental process, which clearly would have happened. Yeah. You know, I, I truly think if that exemption hadn't existed, we still might be trying to talk about how to get a stadium in Los Angeles. Got it. You know, the the fact that, you know, the land came available, we were able to buy it. Um, that, you know, quite frankly, no one had come back to Los Angeles in the 21 years, which I still kind of find, you know, amazing. But I, I think it truly took someone like Stan, who is both a, you know, savvy teen owner and savvy real estate person to figure out how you do it. And, you know, the one thing he always said, and this was kind of the guiding principle was you can't undershoot Los Angeles. This is a sports and entertainment capital of the world. Like this stadium has to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Hollywood Park has to be amazing. And, and so really when we sat down with HKS, who at the time had designed the Cowboy Stadium, which became AT&T Stadium. They designed Lucas Oil in Indianapolis, which was great. They designed U.S. Bank Stadium in Minnesota, which was awesome. Like, It was really, okay, how do we go design the world's greatest building? We all kind of tag teamed it together. Um, and what's amazing is what you see at SoFi now was probably after two months, we kind of quickly fell upon this idea of what's so – like the original design of SoFi only took about two months to kind of figure out. And once we saw it, we're like, that's it. You know, that's that's the building. And it's amazing still walking through this day. I'll get deja vu of walking through a space now a decade later yeah. that you had seen in a rendering or had been kicked around in a conference room. And you're like, every now and then you're still like, holy crap, we actually built this thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's the most expensive stadium ever, ever built, right? I hope not. I hope I hope someday someone passes. But them, so but, far. But, yeah, yeah. But I, I think we'll own the record for a while. I'll yeah, say that. it's going to have to be an interesting market that decides to. I mean, again, Los Angeles can justify that. There's not many markets that you can just go do that. And so a couple more questions for you. Number one, what's next? Like, how, how do you see sort of the advancement now that you're here? You've had a few years in there. You had a Super Bowl hosted there as well as win. And I'm lucky enough to be there. Like, what do you kind of how are you thinking about the future coming down the line? I think it's really twofold, right? I'm, you know, you're, you're fortunate to have had these great experiences to, you know, you're never going to top opening a stadium in your first year in your hometown, hosting a Super Bowl, winning that Super Bowl <laughs> in that stadium the first year it's open. Yeah. Like you never, like in, in the seminal moments of your career, nothing will top that, yeah. right? Like, and, and I still remember sitting, you know, standing on the podium, kind of looking around being like, this is you know, if this were a Hollywood script, no one would believe it, right? Like, you, you know, you, you come back, you, I mean, obviously the stadium had opened the year before COVID, so it was the first year with fans. Yeah, great. First year with fans, your stadium's open, you know, you host a Super Bowl in it and, and you win that Super Bowl, you know, like 
there's no way that, that that makes any sense. And, you know, but I think for the NFL being gone 21 years, it's such a long path to get back to where, you know, we should be as an organization. So for me, you know, like people mention us in the same breath as the Lakers and the Dodgers, but like we've got to continue to work to kind of earn that. Yeah. You know, I want to be one of the 10, you know, this team should be one of the 10 biggest sports brands in the world up there with, you know, Lakers, Cowboys, Yankees, Arsenal, Barcelona, Man U, like that's where this team should be. That's the mission you go to work with every day. And, you know, while we've done amazing leaps and bounds, like we're not at that pantheon yet. So really that's, you know, that's step number one. And then step number two is, you know, growing the talent within the building, you know, you know, I really hope that the person who takes over the Rams, you know, and takes it to the next level is someone who, you know, is in the building right now and can go do that and, you know, take it to the next step. And it really, at this point, it's as much about mentorship and the next generation and developing that talent and seeing those people grow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think those are really, those are the two challenges left in, in the NFL. Look, you want to go compete and win a Super Bowl every year. You know, you're someone, if you sign up to work in sports, you're somewhat of a masochist, you know. Right. One out of 32 teams in our league goes home happy. You know, we were, we're fortunate enough to have won a Super Bowl. We we're, for, you know, fortunate enough to have been in a Super Bowl, but ultimately lost. You know, and there's the hollow feeling when you wake up the next day and you're like, wow, like that, <laughs> we, we did all that work and came up empty handed. Yeah. Uh, you know, nobody remembers the Super Bowl loser. No one remembers the team who, who lost in the divisional round. Like you were in a job where you either win the Super Bowl or you don't. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, once you're fortunate enough to bend to one, let alone win one, you realize how hard it is, how lucky you have to be. Everything has to break your way just to have a chance to go to go compete. So I have such admiration for the Patriots. I mean, yeah. to go to nine Super Bowls, I think, in 20 years is is just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, you know, to win six of them and, you know, you look at a team as, you know, great as the Chiefs have been, you know, they've won two, you know, in the past yeah. Six years. The 49ers have, you know, obviously been awesome. They haven't won. I mean, you look at, I, I was telling people, I think the Patriots ruined, you know, the Packers had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers for 30 years and won one Super Bowl. Well, yeah, that's great. Two. Yeah. Two Super Bowls. I'm sorry. Two, you know, in that time. But like, that is insane. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, when you actually think about just how hard it is to actually go do. Yeah. You know, but I think ingraining this team within Los Angeles, making sure SoFi Stadium is the world's greatest stadium, whether it's hosting the World Cup, hope getting into the Super Bowl, you know, we're home to the opening and closing ceremonies in 2028, That'd be awesome. you know, for the Olympics. So, you know, it's making sure the stadium lives up to that, the team lives up to that. And I think, you know, I'll probably be 50 right around when the Olympics come. And I think that's the, the right point to say, you know, we've checked every box here. Hopefully all of it goes well. Hopefully we've got another Super Bowl ring and, Lombardi Trophy, and you know by then it's time to go hand it to someone else. Nice, got it. And one little follow up on that: in terms of building a fan base, like you mentioned, the Lakers, the you know the Yankees, these kind of places, it seems like a lot of that is like I grew up this with this as a kid. So does part of your calculation go like thirty years from now when we're still here, that will be when we hit, or are you act, are you, are you looking at ways to try to accelerate that in some way? It's both. Okay. I mean, I would tell you one of our key focus points right now is kids, right? The kids who grew up, yeah, because that's when you develop your fandom and, you know, you start, you know, one of the challenges of coming back to Los Angeles was you, you know, the NFL had had such success here. You could still watch Sunday ticket. You could still play fantasy football. You got the best games on Fox and CBS, NBC and ESPN every week. Like you didn't need, like Los Angeles was the proof that you didn't need a team in your city to actually be a good NFL market, yep. right? And so then the Rams come back, which was awesome. But, uh, you know, you get to this point where, you know, everybody who had grown up here for a generation had grown up rooting for another team. Yeah. You know, people who had moved here from other cities from 1995 to 2016, you know, if you're from Pittsburgh, you're still a Steelers fan because there was no team to root for. And I think, you know, it's like LA has a bar for every team. Yeah. Right? So... You know, if you're a Browns fan, there's a Browns bar. Yep. If you're a Vikings fan, there's a Vikings bar. And like people have their rituals. So, you know, it's one thing to convince people to start to root for the Rams, right? Okay, instead of watching, you know, the game that's on CBS, I'll watch the Rams game that's on Fox. Yep. Then you've got to convince people now, okay, you used to spend all your, even if you're a diehard football fan, you spent all your Sundays on the couch watching a fantasy team. Now you're going to spend seven hours coming to the game, tailgating, going to the game, going home, right? Yep. That's your new Sunday. You know, changing those habits is really hard. Yeah. And, 
you know, especially when someone, you know, identifying. So one of the things, and I still remember one of my best friends here, he grew up in Chicago. You know, we actually worked together at Broadband Sports in 2000. And, you know, so when the team comes back, we're playing the Bears. He's got sideline passes and everybody but his son is wearing Bears gear. <laughs> and his son's wearing a Todd Gurley jersey. It's 2018. And I'm like, that's LA in a nutshell, yeah. right? Like, this is one of my best friends. He's a season ticket holder to the Rams. <laughs> And the Bears show up and he's wearing his Bears yep. jersey, right? Yep. And like, by the way, I had no issue with yep. that. But his son was all in on the Rams, yep. right? And I think that was our mentality of, hey, we're going to go be your kid's favorite team. And we're going to hope we become your second favorite team. Yeah. You know, and that's how we develop fandom. But long term, 20, 30 years from now, those kids become exactly. you and me. Yep. They buy season tickets. They do all of that. Yep. And, you know, that to me is, you know, that's a little AAA. But in the meantime, those kids right now aren't buying tickets in – Jersey. So you've got to figure out a way that you thread the needle, that you make it so that, you know, this is also Los Angeles' team right now. We were very fortunate. We, you know, we had a very passionate group of fans who never left the Rams through the journey to St. Louis, yeah. you know, and back. But what, what people kind of forget is, you know, yes, the Rams left in 1995, but they left Anaheim in 1995. They really left greater Los Angeles in 1979 when they went to Anaheim Stadium. Yeah. You know, so you'll talk to people and they'll talk about their memories in the Coliseum. You'll talk to a bunch of fans who grew up in Orange County. Who talked about their memories at Anaheim Stadium, kind of weaving that tapestry back, you know, in how you push a brand forward. You're not just bringing back the 1982 Los Angeles right. Rams, right? You are bringing back the 2016 Rams, the 2023 Rams. Yeah. You know, you're moving into the world's most modern building. How do you take what people love, you know, and try to build it for a modern stadium, a modern era? And, you know, when sports is something people have a ton of nostalgia for, and that's a fine line. You know, to walk all the time. We have a great marketing team, Kat Frederick and, you know, her team. But, you know, at the end of the day, the push-pull is, you know, what is tradition? What is new? And how do you meld the two and go from there? Yep. That makes sense. And so last question for you. What would be your advice to someone trying to pursue their dream? Like you, it's crazy to hear that, like, there was a thread all the way from when you were, you know, as young as can be all the way to now in terms of what your dreams were. But Let's say whenever that comes up for someone that wants to pursue it, what's the advice that you either did get or wish you got along the way that helped you just go for it like this? You know, I, th there are two things I would say. And one is you have to leave your comfort zone. Like the right move when I was in Tampa was to stay in Tampa, <laughs> you know, let my nine month pregnant wife stay in Tampa, not add all this stress, you know, not pick up and move, not take the crazy job that you were pretty certain wouldn't work. But you know, but you go take a risk, right? And I think, you know, in your career, you know, at the times when you take a risk, nothing is ever linear, right? Like you can look back on your career and say like, oh, it all makes sense. It's kind of a straight arc. It is. But when you're in the moment, there are left turns, there are detours, you hit reverse, you go forward. Like I always tell people, don't plan your next step because it is almost inevitable. What you think is your next step is not your next step. Yeah. And it makes you not open to the way the universe is actually shaping your career. Yeah. Right. So like take the bad job, take the risk, be willing to move your family, like do all of the things. Like if you want safe and steady, it's just probably not going to happen. Yeah. Right. So I always tell people be, be open-minded to every opportunity that comes your way. But I also think one of the hard parts, and this will sound counterintuitive. I, I don't think people have enough patience right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if you look at people who are coming out of the workforce, it's like, oh, I want to work for two years, then I want to move a step up. And and look, I'm also not advocating that you need to go back to the 50s and 60s where you work for one company for 40 years. Right. But I think people chase incremental growth at different companies and in different places and different jobs rather than putting in the hard work yep. to push through to meaningful growth. And so my advice to you know, even people at the Rams, I'm like, your next job should be one you think you can't actually do. Yeah. That you're scared of waking up. And like when someone actually tells you the job, you're like, wait, I can, can I really do that? Like there's got to be a part of you that's scared that you won't be able to do that. If you're not scared, it's not a big enough leap for you to actually go take. Yep. You know, and so that's where I always tell people, be patient enough and earn your stripes so that when you're ready to take that jump, you get the, you jump four steps, not one. Right? Okay. Like, and and that way you build credibility, you build mentors, like you, you build your network and you do all of that. But when you take that job, like you should be like, oh, this is the job I really want. I don't want to go from being a manager, like try to go from being a manager to a VP, you know, build your credibility, but then and go somewhere small, go somewhere different. Like yeah. don't chase the brand name, chase the best experience. Yeah. Like I always tell people 
on your resume, it's fine that you can, I can look at where you worked, right? But when I interview you, when I sit with you, I want to hear what you did. Yeah. Right? Like, I want to know what you learned and what you did and what you championed. Not that you had the brand Halo. Yep. But then what did you actually learn and do? Because I'm hiring you for you. I don't get to bring the brand that's on your, your resume. Yep. And so I always think like people should be willing to take the job that's more hands-on, maybe pays less, like all these things, like go build your career brick by brick, put in the work, be patient. And when you see an opportunity, go after it hard. But don't just think like, oh, I'm going to stair step it up because I just don't think that happens. No, we see that same thing like all the time where people like take that incremental, you know, pay raise, whatever, and leave their company, didn't spend enough time to learn their skill sets, go to a new company and they end up, you look at their resume a decade later and it's these one and two year stints everywhere where it's like you probably didn't actually get the full education of the job by doing that. And so you don't actually. Right. I think like to me, and it's not that, oh, they people moved around. It's like, did you actually see something grow to fruition, right? right? Exactly. Did you go through the ups and downs? Yeah. Did you go somewhere and make mistakes that you can actually learn from? Yeah. Right, like to me, that's the arc of, I wanna see that you had highs and that you had lows. We all learn best from our lows. Yes. Yeah. Like, and and so to me, that's what you wanna, you wanna be able to talk to someone about like, what was the best part? What was the worst part? What was your worst day? Yeah. You know, and I, I think that's to me, like you, you stair step it up and you look back in eight years and you're like, okay, I'm now a VP. But how did I get to where I am? Yeah. Right? Like, is this what I actually wanted? Or did I chase incremental growth rather than sticking it out and really shooting for huge growth opportunities? Totally agree. Well, Kevin, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Hawk Talk. My pleasure. It was fun. Absolutely.